open to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Follow along as I read verses 15 through 21. 15 through 21. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let's pray. Blessed Father, glorious Father, Father in heaven who sits on his throne, and someday there will be an exchange between the Son and the Father. There's a scroll that's been written. It's a scroll of judgments that have yet to be executed upon this planet as we know it. And there's no one worthy to open that scroll except Jesus. He is worthy. He is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Surely that exchange is on the horizon. It will be seen that he is worthy to execute these judgments upon this planet. Father, we are worthy of judgment. As, as believers, we thank you that Jesus took that judgment for us on that ignominious cross, a shameful cross, where criminals were crucified for committing heinous crimes. And yet he is there because he told the truth. I am the blessed one, the Son of God. Oh, our Father, thank you for Christ. And, and indeed, we concur with the songwriter, all that thrills. My soul is Jesus. As Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So bless us in our understanding of your word. May the Spirit of God now, whom we read about, Give us understanding. We depend upon him for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 I, I, it, it just finally dawned on me, uh, and I don't know why, I've sung that song, you know, dozens of times through the years, and that's the song Amazing Grace. I guess it becomes so. Routine, we hear it so often, and I am convinced that a lot of people don't even pay attention to the words because of its familiarity. But that second, or the first stanza, actually, Amazing Grace, a sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amen. Was blind, but now I see. That phrase, I once was lost, captures much of what we see in this text as we've looked through it. You are reminded we were once darkness, verse 8. Once darkness, now you're sons of light. Chapter 2, verse 2, you once walked according to the course of this world. And it reflects indeed the sentiment that the writer John Newton placed in his song. 
once was lost, now found, was blind. The implication is I was once blind, but now I see. All of us born into this world are marred Amen. by sin. Yes. We've all experienced the result of sin. Yes. And in conversion, if true conversion takes place, and I, in, in our day and age I have to frame it that way, yes. true conversion. If there is indeed conversion in the life, there is a change. It, it's necessary. By the very nature, you're different than you were when you trusted Christ. You are different than you were when the Spirit of God imparted life and quickening to you. And you trusted the Savior, and now the Bible refers to you as a new man, a new creation. Something internally transformed. It changed. That's the nature of conversion. As he said to the Thessalonians, you turn from idols to serve the true and living God. Amen. There's a change in one's life. Amen. So I ask you this morning, can you testify to what Newton testified to? I once was, but now I'm found. Amen. That's, that's the nature of conversion. And so it implies in that that there's a change of behavior. God, God goes through us, through our being, our souls, our spirits, our minds, and He changes the way we think. He changes the way we respond in life. And it's all because of that. And so he reminds his readers as he reminds us. As we saw in chapter 4, verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. And he describes what's going on here is putting off an old life pictured in a garment. You take it off and you discard it. You destroy it. You put to death the old man. And he begins that list of garments that are to be removed in verse 25. Putting away lying. Speak truth. Anger. Anger is not irrational and outbursts of anger are not justified. They're not justified. You put that off. Now there is a time to be angry. And we call it righteous anger or justified anger. And even James, when he wrote his epistles, said, with respect to anger, let everybody be swift to hear, so to speak and slow to wrath. And that is, it, it is an incremental, a calculated expression of wrath. It's a controlled expression of anger when it comes out. You get just ticked at every little thing. That changes. You put that off. Verse 28, if you're a kleptomaniac, you stop it. You don't steal, but you put something in its place. You go to work. You earn money so that you can help those who have needs. You see, you're discarding an old life. You say, well, I'm never involved in those things. Well, whatever you were involved in as a sinner, you're to discard that. Your speech changes, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You take off that garment. No longer have a potty mouth. I was listening uh, to an excerpt of a, uh, of a lady, an old lady in Texas who died. She was poisoned by arsenic poison. She and her sister died one day. Uh, that's that's a whole another part of the part of the story. But the people who knew her said she could cuss like a sailor. She would make a sailor look, you know, like a Sunday school. She could curse. Well, that stuff's gone. Bad language. 
And then bad attitudes are gone. Bad attitudes are gone. And then we put off the garment of darkness and manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Now, also, one of the things that changes in our lives, I don't know if you think in these terms, and I wish I would have known it early on in my Christian experience, but I've learned it through the years. One of the things that you are to put off is foolishness. And that's what our text indicates here. Foolishness. Solomon wrote millennia ago in his book, The Ecclesiastes. He wrote in chapter 9 as he, as he took a, a survey, even of the nation of Israel, the nations around him. He said, There is an evil in all that is done under the sun. That one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. And then he writes, madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that they go to the death. Or go to the dead. The New English Version translates it this way, This is the unfortunate fact about everything that happens on earth. The same fate awaits everyone. The fate is death in context. You have an expiration date. In addition to this, the hearts of all people are full of evil. That's this issue of depravity. Mm -hmm. This, that's this issue of, of sin and evil in society. Every man is contaminated with it to some degree or another. And then they write, there is folly. That's the word for foolishness. There's folly in their hearts during their lives. There's, they're evil and they live their lives foolishly. They live their lives foolishly. I've always liked the way the New American Standard translated that verse. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of men are full of evil. And, and they use the, they said the word folly. They use the word insanity. Madness. Everybody experiences some psychosis. There is insanity in the heart of men. Since the fall of man, it manifests itself in the conflict between Cain and Abel. And I've often thought about that story and that, that problem that existed. Here his brother is obedient to the Lord, Abel, and he offers a more excellent sacrifice, and the reason it's more excellent is because he offers it by faith in obedience to express instruction ostensibly given to Adam, to his sons, as to how to worship the true and living God. And yet Jane, his brother Cain is envious, jealous, why? Because insanity, madness, resides in his heart. Yes. And he, and he becomes possessed by it. Evil has overtaken him. And he takes his brother's life. That's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here in the assembly in Ephesus. There's no difference in Rio Rico. And throughout our country and throughout the world, the, the reality is that people that we rub shoulders with, especially in the unregenerate community, are not wise. So see then that you walk. The word walk means to conduct your life. It's a command. See then that you walk. And he's used that word, as we've seen, throughout this epistle seven times. He's talking about our lifestyle, our conduct, how people 
see us and perceive us and how we perceive our life. And he says that you are to walk circumspectly. Could be translated accurately, attentively, diligently, or as some translations put it, carefully. In other words, as you are living your life, you are to take accurate uh, assessment of the steps of your life. It, it, it demands thought. You, through conversion, your folly has been restored. Your foolishness has been changed. And now you have to live a life that is wise. And of course, this is the language that's taken from the book of Proverbs, wisdom literature. It's wisdom language. The world is not wise. All you have to do is look in the media, look in politics today, look in the educational systems of our day, and it yeah. manifests itself in a bunch of fools. Yep. Yeah. Amen. A bunch of fools trying to educate fools. I was reading one of the steps that Marx used in destroying the society. And one of the steps that he used was to destroy all history. And that's what's being attempted today. That's Marxism right. is on the march in right. society today. And it's foolishness on display. It's folly. Don't get caught up in it. Mm -hmm. Don't caught, caught, get caught up in this woke moment that's taking place in evangelicalism. Everybody's getting woke to racism. There's always been racism. There's racism among peoples of the earth. That's I right. read uh, years ago about the situation in Japan. There was, there, you would think, well, they're from the same heritage. They look, they look basically alike. There wouldn't be any racism is there, but it's there. Yep. In Rwanda, yep. it was there between people of the same color. We traced probably their ancestry back to the same Genesis from Ham, if that was the case. We're all descended from Adam, but racism exists. Now, I don't believe that we should be racist. We're all of one kind, but it's the foolishness that pervades our society, not governed by the Word of God. And so, he says, if you live, as you live your life, you live it accurately. Yes. And the accuracy is de derived not from within. Oh, just get in touch with your heart. We're told. Just look inward. Mistake. Yeah. You're to look outward. And the place you're to look and to study and to understand is this book. In my scripture reading, I read through the book of Proverbs very frequently. Very frequently. And it is a book of wisdom. It's not just a bunch of aphorisms out there. And it says of unregenerate man, it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's right. Amen. That's foolishness. Profound foolishness. Your worldview has got to change radically. And your worldview has to be built from this book. You have to attend to this book. Otherwise, if you think that you can get it through other sources, that you can get it, to your, you get it from your friends, mistake. I've been there, done that, didn't get wisdom from my friends <laughs> growing up. I was immersed in utter foolishness and insanity. And obviously, conversion changed them. People would ask, how come you don't live like this? I said, I've been watching you, you're different now. Well, it's because of conversion. Thanks to God. And you're to walk circumspectly, which means you are to be a student. You, you to, to accurately assess life and all of the 
problems that you face. So the, the, the garment is to be discarded here, and I think it's following in the same pattern. You get rid of something, but you take something else in its place. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. What you get rid of here is foolishness. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, in the implication, as fools do, but as wise people do, as wise people are supposed to do. It was Jesus who told his disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. And that's a word that's taken from the book of Proverbs. It's wisdom language. Do not be children in understanding. The idea is to be mature in your understanding. However, in malice, be babes. That is, be innocent with respect to malice. But in understanding, be mature. It implies that in the, the, the new life, that the goal, the progress, is toward maturity. Maturity. That's wisdom. To the Colossians, this is a parallel book to Ephesians in many ways. And it may have been carried by the very person who carried the book of Ephesians to Ephesus. Colossians 1 verse 9, for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's a key word found in the book of Proverbs too. The word knowledge. But it's not just any knowledge. It is knowledge that is founded and derived from this book. I hear Dennis Prager, who is a devout Jew, make a false dichotomy between knowledge and wisdom. Now, while on the one hand, you can have knowledge and not be wise, but you cannot be wise and not have knowledge. Because mm -hmm. wisdom is founded on knowledge. You see it in parallel throughout the book of Proverbs, as well as understanding, as well as discernment, as well as prudence. All of these are elements. You see, wisdom is not a standalone term. It involves all of those elements and it begins with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. It's interesting as he closes this section and speaks about the filling of the Spirit that he says, the writes in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. In other words, our governing principle in our relationships with one another is the fear of God. Because we know ultimately we're accountable to Him. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So, you discard foolishness. I, I, I want to speak specifically to young people too. You're born into this world of fool. Now, it's a different foolishness. The Bible describes it this way as being simple. Or we would use the word naive. Yeah. Naive. And Solomon is writing his book to his son. Or as some have understood it, to the next generation. His children coming up. He's writing this volume to teach them how to live wisely in life because he knows they're a bunch of simpletons. And I was there. May still be there, I don't know. <laughs> On some levels. Not as fools. Just acknowledge, first of all, you were born in this world, you were insane. Maybe not clinically insane, where you need to be hospitalized. hospitalized. But you're insane. 
And now if you come to Christ, things change. Your worldview changes and you seek those things that come from the all-wise God. Immortal, in, immortal invisible, all-wise God, the scriptures tell us. And you need to seek wisdom from Him. And then He gives this participial phrase, redeeming the time. One of the express ways to demonstrate your wisdom is how you use time. Well, I know, you know, most people have an occupation, they have to spend time doing that. And it can be redemptive time. But during the day, sometime during the day, you need to spend time with the Lord. That is redemptive time wherein you are fed from the Word of God and you begin to mature in your understanding. Begin to grow. That's redemptive time. It is buying up opportunities. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, be instant in season and out of season. And that is, he says, preach the word and to it when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. That's part of wisdom. That's redeeming time. God help us to use our time redemptively. And here's the phrase that captures the essence of my message. The days are evil. The reason you're to do that is because, it's a reason, it's a solid reason. You're living in evil days. I'm living in evil days. Yes. Amen. And evil days are the manifestation of utter insanity. Things that you think normally make sense. Isaiah lived in that time when they were calling things that were evil good mm -hmm. and good evil. Mm -hmm. Everything is turned around. Everything is convoluted. Mm -hmm. It is good to let criminals out on the street, but to keep everybody else confined in their homes. <laughs> That's some of the insanity of our hour. Healthy people. These days we live in are unprecedented evil. I've never seen it in 73 years, going in 74. And I've seen evil times back during the sexual revolution back in the late 60s. And then when they were int introducing this new math and new educational forms back then. Therefore, he says, and he picks up the theme again, do not be unwise. He uses a different word than the word fool. It, now it's interesting, this word fool or fools is only used one, one place in the New Testament, that's here. The word wise is sophios. We get the word sophomore, it's a combination. You know what a sophomore is? My granddaughter is a sophomore this year. I said, you know what that means, don't you? This is a, it's a wise fool. <laughs> Sophos and moron. Sophomore. Moronic. Combined together. And uh, Joni heard me tell that to her. And she says, that's true. She's taught in high school for many years. And she said, it's interesting when sophomores come in. They think they know everything. <laughs> Amen. But they're moronic. <laughs> That's that first word. It, it, it's the words. It's actually the word with the alpha privative or negation. Like atheist, theist is one who believes in God, and atheist is one who says no, there is no God. Uh, the fool here is a sophia. That is fools. People who think they're wise, but really they're absent of wisdom. There's no wisdom in them, and so they're called fools. 
And so he's, he's admonishing them here uh, further, but using a, a variation and, and of the theme of wisdom. It, it means without understanding, basically. Mm -hmm. Without understanding. Therefore, do not be unwise, and he said, but understand. So the goal of, of the Christian life is, is to develop wisdom in all of its facets, to be able to evaluate right and wrong, up and down, inside and out. This is wrong because that's discernment. And it's based on understanding. In other words, you've assessed all the information, you put together all the pieces and of, the, of the puzzle, and you make assessments and decisions based on it. And you, you, come to a comprehensive understanding of things. To seek understanding is to seek to be wise. Discernment. Prudence. And speak up. That's all because we live in evil times. Mm -hmm. If you're going to walk circumspectly, this is the way you have to navigate. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is his prescriptive will. That's what he's talking about. Now when it comes to his providential will, sometimes we can figure it out. Sometimes we can navigate through that. And sometimes we can. I remember years ago when I was contemplating going uh, to uh, graduate school to pick up my mas Master of Theology or Master of Divinity degree. And I was a dilemma between two schools. I was accepted at Grace Theological Seminary in Manoa Lake, which is a good school. And I was also accepted at Dallas Theological Seminary. And I had to make a decision based on that. I had to, had to uh, weigh things. Well, things fell and I decided to go to Dallas Seminary. I'm glad I did in many ways. I'm sure I would have got it just as good, if maybe not even that, I don't know. But what I learned at Dallas was very, very helpful in understanding Scripture. I primarily wanted to develop my understanding of expository preaching. That's why I went there. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. And so I had, had to make a decision, use wisdom, weighing all of the factors involved. And that's what you're going to have to do. When you get out from underneath the roof of your house, that's what you had to do. I couldn't go back to my dad and say, what do you think, Dad? Because he hadn't considered all the factors. It's the same with you. So his providential will is not always easy, but his prescriptive will is easy. His commands, his clear black and white commands, that are given in scripture. It's wrong to kill people. Why, why, why should there be any debate about that? It's wrong to bear false witness. Mm -hmm. It's wrong to commit adultery. Mm -hmm. Homosexuality is wrong because the will of the Lord says it's wrong. Do not be unwise, and the church has become infected. I, I assure you it has, because I keep abreast of what's going on. So you are to redeem the time, knowing the days are evil. Therefore, stop this madness of the rest of the world. I remember as a young kid, the, the magazine came out, Mad Magazine, yeah. remember that? For you? Yeah. I don't know if it's still available yeah. or not. Is, is Mad still marketed today? It's so, but it was, it was a satire magazine on political things and so on and so forth. But it's, it basically demonstrated mad, the mad world that we live in. He moves on in verse 18, and I move there very rapidly. 
it relates to another aspect of the garments that we are to discard. And notice it's in contrast again. There's behavior that's unacceptable, and then there is behavior that is to be embraced, or a path that is to be embraced. Do not be drunk with wine, wherein is dissipation or excess. This is being inebriated to the nth degree. Years ago, I, I would go up into northern Michigan with friends of mine, and one of their relatives would do a barbecue, and he would say, I know how, my, how long to cook my steaks. And he said, after I've drunk 23, I don't know if steaks or roast, but after 23 be beers, I know it's done. That's how he measured time, by being excessive with drink, being inebriated and drunk. He's, he's talking here primarily in, in the idolatrous worship of the day, that they would become so sopped with alcohol that supposedly it lifted them into an ecstasy of worship in the pagan temples of that day. They were out of their minds. That's what happens when people a lot of times get drunk, is that their behavior, their whole thinking processes, their mentality changes. What's happening there is that you are controlled internally from some type of chemical substance. And in this case, it's alcohol. I think this verse expands even beyond that to our day because some of the drugs that are taken today that affect the way people live and think and move <clears throat> control it. It, 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 it's, it applies across a broad spectrum of behavior. Young know, people don't get involved in drug, drugs. Please don't. It's not worth it. Any ecstasy that you obtain from it is not worth the bondage that, that comes along with it. Because once one gets involved in that, then they're hooked. It's an old bait and switch tactic. These drug dealers give you a little bit of, for a discounted price. And once they get you hooked, then you've got to come back, resupply. That's a control. That's an excess. Instead of being controlled in that way, discard that. Do not be drunk with wine, but in your life be filled with the Spirit. What does the word fill mean? It means to be controlled. It means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Jesus compared the Spirit's movement to wind. The wind blows where it will. And you hear the sound thereof, you don't know where it comes or where it goes. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit blows like wind. And one of the absolute essential ingredients to Christian life is to be filled. It's a word that's used throughout the book of Acts, especially in preaching situations where the evangelist or the teacher is filled with the Spirit. He's controlled. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to my wife. And I said, I, I said, I had real freedom this morning. Sometimes I struggle when I'm preaching. You may say, well, you're struggling now. <laughs> I don't know but to be controlled by the Spirit is, 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 is that, that He gives you a real freedom, a sense of His control, a direction in your preaching. And this filling is to be manifest. He, he gives several participles here to describe that filling. First of all, is speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual 
uh, songs. In other words, it's the music program of the church. There's not a whole lot said about it in the New Testament, other than the fact that it was primarily congregational singing. It wasn't like a nightclub where they had people coming up and giving special numbers necessarily. It wasn't entertainment. Music as it was developed and expressed even by David was congregational singing primarily. Now individually David composed his own songs, but they were sung in the congregation. And they're described here psalms, which takes us to the Psalter, hymns, that is hymns that contain truth. Some believe that Philippians chapter 2 is what's called the Carmen Christi, and that is a song about Christ dealing with his humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Some believe that that was a song that was written and sung in the early church. Songs are to contain theological truth. They are to teach you theological truth, doctrinal truth. I remember years ago here, during Christmas time, that I dealt with some of the carols. One of them is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. That, that, is, a, that is a Christmas carol that is just filled with doctrine written by Charles Wesley, but he was oriented that way. Not so much today. The songs today appeal to the emotions rather than the, to the intellect. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. In other words, it's an act of worship. Another participle that explains what it meant to be filled with the Spirit in the assembly is to be constantly giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of Jesus. Thanksgiving is to be a rudimentary part of the Christian experience, especially in the assembly. That's why on Wednesday nights I give opportunity for people to express thanks and express praise to the Lord. And here's one, submitting to one another, that explains a spirit-controlled life rather than a life controlled by chemicals. A spirit-controlled life is that you submit to one another predicated on the idea of the fear of God. Now we'll see as this text unfolds how it applies in all of the areas in the assembly with wives with husbands, with children, with fathers, with bond servants, all of these facets of the assembly as they come together demonstrate spirit fulfilling. I just close with this illustration. It was written by Andrew Wilson, contributor to Christianity Today, and he said, when you're sailing, is being filled with the wind. An experience, is it a habit or an experience? He said, both. Catching the wind on a sailboat is clearly an experience. I vividly remember the first feeling of being seized and carried forward by a mighty power from elsewhere. But it's also a habit. If you don't put the sails up, pull the main sheet fast, and adjust the jib, you won't go anywhere. Even if the wind is blowing powerfully, Sailing, in that sense, is the art of attempting responsiveness to an external power. You rely entirely on the external power to get you anywhere. Sailors never imagine themselves of being the power behind the boat. Doing it in their own strength. 
And it's the same with the spirit. Now it's internal. It's not just an external thing. It's an internal thing. The spirit of God blowing, working in through us, being filled and controlled by him. That verb, walk, that he's used so frequently throughout here is also used in his Galatian epistle where he says to the believers in Galatia, be walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The Christian life is an impossible life apart from the spirit of God. And he's given us the spirit. Shed the garments of the old life. Put on the garments of the new life. And one of those garments is the filling of the Spirit. One of those garments is walking wisely in this life. Take to yourself as a pursuit in life to be wise. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us in these evil days to derive our wisdom from God and to derive our control and our strength through the Spirit of God. Bless us, O oh Father, to the end that we might be mature in our walk with the Lord. O oh, our Father, may you strengthen us to that end. The Lord is my strength and song the psalmist wrote, and has become my salvation. Be our song this morning. Be our strength, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen.